Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's live discussion with Ian Bliss, President and CEO of Northern Shield Resources. Today, Ian will be providing us with a brief update regarding the company, but really, this is your opportunity to ask Ian any questions you may have. So please feel free to submit your questions in the bottom right corner in the chat box there. Now, this event is being recorded and will be available for your viewing shortly afterwards. With that said, Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kyle, and thank you everyone for taking the time this morning uh, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, uh, to get an update on Northern Shield Resources and our root and cellar project. I say this is meant to be a, a more uh, brief update. Uh, it's not a full detailed explanation of all the exploration that's gone on to date, uh, but just an update. I will go into detail on a few things, uh, but if anyone wants more detail at the end, I'll be happy to send along uh, one of the more detailed uh, presentations, or you should find it on the website. So before I begin, I do have to bring your attention to this forward-looking statement advisory as this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. As many of you may know, uh, the Bruton Cellar is located on the Beer Peninsula of Newfoundland, about three hours drive uh, from the capital of St. John's. Uh, there are numerous other epithermal and related copper porphyries uh, in the Avalon terrain, of which the Beer occupies a good portion of the Avalon. Uh, but we're in a very sort of distinct area of uh, of the Avalon uh, terrain and compared to other epithermal belts like down in the nearest one is in uh, in the Carolinas where you have the Hale Gold deposit and the Carolina Gold Belt. This area has received very, very uh, little exploration. One thing when I want when you when you listen to this update of this presentation, uh, one thing is, you know, the lens to kind of look look through is, is this elephant country? And it's sort of a question that you should be asking yourself. And so is it an elephant country? And if so, uh, where is it? And so just to give a quick overview of, of, of Root and Cellar, uh, it was discovered by a prospector in 2012. Nolan Shield was the first company to conduct methodical exploration on the entire property. Minor exploration happened at Braxton Bradley, uh, but nothing on the other, other showings. And I say the, show, the, the property hosts five gold, silver, and tellurium occurrences of our very large area. This seems to overprint uh, a pre-existing uh, copper porphyry style mineralization that's more dominant in the southwest portion uh, of the project. As you can see, some very high grades uh, up to 1,365 grams silver, 700 ppm tellurium, which is very, very high, and up to 111 grams per ton uh, gold, and 10.5% uh, copper and indications of moly as well. So the conquest is really the focus of this presentation and our work to date. And we believe conquest and conquest has been to merge into some of the other showings like windfall, but we believe conquest specifically has all the ingredients to form a giant and high grade epithermal occurrence. So I said, I wasn't going through a, a detailed presentation, just sort of a, a, a list, a quick overview of the key ingredients, why we think number one, uh, this could be a very large uh, epithermal system. Um, and also then where, where, where it is. And so some of those evidence is more sort of circumstantial. Some of it is more uh, in depth and detailed and uh, sort of from big picture to very, very, very uh, fine detail. So, you know, we're talking about elephant country and a very large deposit. First of all, you must have the geology that supports that. And we, we certainly see that at, at root and cellar in a variety of sort of uh, uh, evidence or manifestations. Uh, we have a very large footprint of gold, silver, and tellurium mineralization and copper, as you'll see, and as you already know. And more importantly, we also were backed this up by all the pathfinder elements that you expect to see in an epithermal occurrence, namely arsenic, antimony, mercury, and potassium. We th see these related to the uh, to, to the mineralization. That's very important. It helps substantiate the fact that are, we are doing with uh, uh, a very active uh, and long-lived epithermal system. Tellurium is, is really a key ingredient here. Uh, not only is it an added potential value at the end of the day, because tellurium is a critical metal uh, used in the construction of solar panels on certain uh, uh, batteries, but uh, tellurium is also uh, known to be, to be associated with a very large and high grade uh, epithelial deposits. Think of Cripple Creek, Porgera, et cetera, are all examples of tellurium bearing. Uh, epithermal systems. And they're often related to the alkaline or subalkaline, and those themselves, as I say, are associated with very large systems. The copper porphyry mineralization is not only important because we may have a copper porphyry, and of course, copper porphyries and epithermals are, are related, they're end members of, of the same system. 
But if you look around the world, many of the, you know, the really high grade and large epithermal occurrences, and thinking of Bruce Jack and Futa at the Norte in Ecuador, uh, as an example off the top of my head, these are both sort of in the shadows of copper porphyries or aborted copper porphyries. They all have indications that copper porphyry mineralization was once present. And I say uh, a lot of these large systems are often uh, in the shadows of these copper porphyry systems. And we certainly see that at, at root and cellar. Alteration, uh, any deposit, any especially the larger and longer lift they are, they have very large and intense alteration halos. And we see that at, at root and cellar. In fact, it's somewhat a problem because they all, these alterations are changing the rock so much that we don't know what the original protolith was, but that's somewhat a good problem because all large uh, high grade systems are usually sort of with intense alteration. And we certainly see that at, at, at uh, root and cellar. And as you'll see later on this, in this presentation, uh, the level of erosion is now we're just eroding the rocks down to the level of this system as it formed uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. So the whole system is intact. Other deposits on the Bureau Peninsula still have been known that they're eroded down below the bonanza grade, uh, bonanza level. So you're not going to get a lot of high grade gold. The well, complete system is intact at root and cellar, and that bodes well against both the potential grades we will encounter at depth, but also the size of the deposit. And geophysics, I say, uh, uh, you know, large systems usually disrupt the physical characteristics of the rocks. And we see that at root cellar, particularly in the magnetics, uh, where, where there's a very strong correlation between mineralization and magnetic lows. And again, the alteration will destroy the magnetic signature of the rock. And we certainly see that at, at root and cellar. So a lot of evidence here of, of, uh, of a very large uh, system. This is one of the what I call sort of circumstantial evidence of something big, and you know it's just it's not direct evidence, but clearly something is different happening in this portion of the Bering Peninsula. These images of the one on the left is a digital elevation model, so topography. The one on the bottom right is magnetics, and you can clearly see there's something disrupting. You know the topography here is basically a low lying swath, uh, and you see the same thing on the geophysics, whereas in most parts the Magnetic signature is following the trend of the Bering Peninsula. In here, there's a break. So something is happening. We believe this is to what we call an extension regime, where at one point the, the, the rocks are sort of being pulling apart. And as I pull apart, of course, that allows fluids and, and magma to come up. And so there's a better opportunity for, for uh, lots of magmatic activity and, and hydrothermal activity when you have that sort of an extensional regime. Then, of course, to get down into the into some of the, the, the main direct evidence, and that is we have a large footprint of gold mineralization, uh, both in rocks, surface sampling, uh, soil sampling, and and in drill holes. So you see the you know the conquest zone, and say conquest, we begin to think maybe linked up to, to windfall. We have an area about two by two kilometers uh, with gold mineralization. Now, some of this you may say is low grade; it's 0.1, but that's still gold mineralization, and that's mineralization that. We're not in the heart of the system. This is just mineralization that's being leaking through cracks and along geological contacts uh, from depth. And so there's a very large footprint. Uh, and here we almost have continuous mineralization in the southern conquest zone. A lot of high grades, 111 grams. That's a boulder. We now have uh, 78 grams uh, in the discovery zone based on work at the end of the summer. But the bottom line, a large footprint of gold mineralization uh, shown by the red squares. Again, the, the red dots are showing soil samples anomalous in gold. So clearly, especially out here, you can see there's a nice trend to these anomalies. Uh, and we haven't found any rocks. So that's telling us there's another uh, uh, subcropping mineralization somewhere in this area that we haven't found yet. The red hash marks are IP chargeability anomalies. So we know in the main conquest zone, there's quite a strong correlation with the mineralization we're seeing so far and IP chargeability. And of course, in Conquest North, we've got quite a large IP. It's fairly deep uh, underneath this ridge. Uh, but you can see on the fringes of it, you can see both anomalous soils in gold and a handful of rock samples. So that strongly suggests that this is also uh, potentially gold bearing, or at least parts of it uh, at depth. So a very, very large footprint of gold mineralization in, in the greater Conquest zone. Now I'm going to, this is one of the, I said, I said some of it's very uh, direct detail and large scale. Now I'm going to go to some really fine detail. And this is some of the latest evidence that we picked up at uh, Root and Cellar. Uh, and this has been carried out by an MSD student at Memorial University who really used some innovative application of, of geochemistry. You know, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but at the same point, I think it's really neat. And that's why I want to share it to you. So what he did 
he went back and read a paper for uh, Wahi, New Zealand. Wahi is a six million ounce epithelial gold deposit in New Zealand, and it's been around for quite some time. And work there showed that if you basically plot these potassium versus sodium ratios, and the idea is that in epithermal systems, we have a certain set of minerals that we look for. Adularia is, is the main one. And as you get into the boiling zone, you start seeing adularia, which is a potassium rich mineral. But sometimes it's hard to identify these minerals. And so what the student has done through looking at this paper at, at Wahi New Zealand was try to use chemistry as a proxy for the minerals. So adularia is high in potassium. And so if you're getting in the adularia which shown, which would be close to the boiling zone, you'd expect higher potassium ratios. And in this case, these are that are color coded on this plot with gold values. So, you know, the oranges, the yellows, the reds, and the purples are all samples that are also high in gold. So you can clearly see there's a strong association with gold bearing samples than those that have high potassium and relatively low sodium. So we did that both for drill holes and in, in surface samples, but we say, see the same thing that the gold is associated with adularia, but we're using potassium as a proxy for adularia. So we then take, take these samples, color code them according to Wahi, and, and plot them up. And as you can see, you know, in the main conquest zone, the red, which are your adularia dominant samples, are clearly see that in the conquest zone. And then the purple, which is adularia present, you know, and here we have present and dominant. And interesting enough, as we move westward from conquest, we see a bunch of samples that also have adularia present. And so Again, this is fairly topographically high area, so maybe we're further above the system. And that's why it's adularia present and not, and not dominant. But it kind of suggests uh, that the conquest zone may continue another 750 meters uh, further west. And lo and behold, uh, drop zone sits somewhere over here. So uh, almost a long tr trend of that, uh, uh, a long strike of that, of that same trend. So very innovative work uh, from this MSC student. And it's just one more data set so that semi uh, independent from what for what we're doing, um, but that's helped support the same notion uh, that we're, we're exploring in the right area. And to take it even closer look, again, now we're kind of zooming into uh, that Southern Conquest area. Uh, this is what we call the Discovery Trench area. We did a lot of drilling in 2023. So again, you know, the, the red and the purple samples are adularia dominant or adularia present. And as you can see in this area, nearly all the drill holes, and here zooming into the drill holes from last year, you know that they are all dominated by the adularia dominate sequence. As you move further away, you have adularia or some of the other minerals, smectonite, kaolinite, and wheat clay, which happens as you move away. Um, but clearly, as you move into this portion of the conquest uh, area, you're getting the alteration is dominated by adularia. So. I mean, we had other evidence that this was what we call the outflow zone, but this was uh, a very different style of, of tool to use, completely independent of what we were using and seeing in the field, but it comes up with the same answer. So it's much more sort of scientific and in-depth than some of the rocks and the textures that we see, but again, it all reinforces the same interpretation that we're seeing. So uh, from the big scale down to the really minute detail, which is thesis is, uh, student work is working on, we see the same thing. And that's pointing to this area as to one of the upflow zones. And again, as from previous, now we're zooming into that upflow zone. Okay, and this is where we found a lot of visible gold in trenching in uh, early 2023 last year, followed up by the diamond drilling, uh, where again, we saw uh, uh, Three drill holes came back with, uh, with visible gold. Seven of the eight holes drilled in this area came back with mineralization. And as you can see from this map, which shows both drill hole samples and surface samples, there's almost continuous mineralization uh, in this area. So again, that would suggest you're getting closer to the main fluid flow of where this gold mineralization uh, was, was coming up. So this is the latest occurrence of Visible gold in outcrop uh, discovered at the end of the summer, rounding 78 grams per ton, again in a quartz vein, was found very close, just behind hole number 21, which we hit visible gold at the top of that hole. Uh, but this was a different style. So we know if he had actually backed off that drill hole, we would have got a better intersection of uh, and, and with higher rays, but, you know, continuous uh, mineralization uh, in this area. One of the important things that we noticed both in drill hole and on surface is the identification of what we call center material, which forms uh, basically the top of where these epithermal fluids basically breach the surface at the time of formation. And we see that very well in this, in this outcrop that we stripped off. So this is uh, about 
uh, 30 meters uh, west, uh, where we found the visible gold uh, last year. So we're, first of all, we're finding uh, a lot of visible gold, as you can see from this photograph here. It's in a breccia. We have these center fragments uh, here that appear to be sitting on top. They're really a vertical layer behind where the gold is. But then lying on top, we have a, a layer of basaltic rock, which is it's altered, but it's not that strongly altered next to no globalization. So we know this layer of, of, of lava came after or very late in the minimizing sequence. So what it does is cap, uh, even though you're getting, you know, 78 grams per ton gold, not even a meter below it, you're not seeing any evidence of it uh, in this rock because that was post minimization. And that's critical to think of when we were walking around the rest of the property is, you, you know, you might find really, really subtle alteration like this, make no gold, but it's indicating that 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 epithelial system may be right below it. Even though there's no gold and very little indication of your pathfinder elements, these things very effectively cap the minimization. So it's something we've got to keep in mind when um, walking around the, the rest of the property. But this outcrop is a sort of shows it all. So it shows a capping rock, these center fragments, uh, which we'll have a closer look at later to see where they are in the system. Collar from crust from veining. This is where you're meaning you are getting closer to the to the boiling zone and of course, uh, visible gold. And the fact that we're basically in the center mound with visible gold is, is a very good sign as to how much gold we might find in the system at depth. So again, when that center mound, okay, these, that forms on top, uh, center mound, think of, think of Yellowstone too, where you have these, these hot fluids uh, spurting to surface and you have these geyser pools and, and the center mound, and we see that, uh, we first of all saw it in drill core, we we're kind of surprised, we didn't know, we weren't 100% sure what it was uh, last year, but we're quite convinced they're, they're hot spring sediments. That tells us we were at the paleo surface. Now we see these center fragments uh, and lots of brecciation. So it's all telling us we're very, very uh, high in the system right at the very top. So at least we now know, uh, you know, basically the, the outflow, we can use up the chemistry as well as the, textures to vector us in, but we're sitting right on top. And that's why we expect somewhere fairly close to below. Sometimes it can be offset a little bit, but we're essentially right on top of, of one of the main vein systems. Uh, and when it comes to the conquest zone, essentially the whole conquest zone will be will be in here. And, and so you could be kind of drilling in between some of these brickier pipes or little vein systems. Um, and, and then you also get lateral flow. And I think a lot of the drilling in 2021 was drilling a lateral flow and that's why we only step back to try to drill underneath it, thinking it extended the depth. It didn't because that fluid flow is actually flowed horizontally along a contact uh, between two different lithological units. But we're very comfortable that we're, we're right at the top of the system. You don't usually expect to see uh, a lot of gold, especially visible gold layer. We are, so that bodes uh, very well to what we may find uh, down in here uh, when we get around to the next round of drilling. And so uh, this is, you know, we have a very good correlation between uh, magnetics uh, and the mineralization and IP and magnetics. So this is a cross section through what we call a 3D magnetic inversion. Uh, sorry, this is a little bit offset, but this is where uh, we've just been looking. All that center mound is, is sitting up in, in here. So this is what we call uh, uh, the center vein. And you can see that, again, a strong correlation to mineralization uh, on surface and drilling to this magnetic low that magnetic lobe kind of continues down almost in branch-like form. And again, all these red bars are, are marking IP chargeability anomalies, and they seem to correlate very, very well to these magnetic lows. Uh, these are discordant features, so they're cutting vertically through the stratigraphy, strongly suggesting structure. And so, you know, in this area here, okay, this is the center mound, so that's probably on top of one of the main veins. In this area here, as we move east, we can see both lateral flow and potentially some other veins coming up. So these are, and this is where we found the 111 gram boulder, which hasn't traveled far at all. Uh, the line 4900 or Hotter's Pond vein system, uh, we don't see a lot of mineralization on the surface, a little bit of leakage, uh, but a very distinct, one of the, the best IP anomaly on the project uh, sits right here and it corresponds to one of the strongest uh, magnetic loads. So very good correlation and it sort of uh, matches up to the classic uh, epithermal system that you would expect to see, just like we saw in this previous diagram here. So we're looking at all these different branches in that, in that cross-section of, of the magnetics. 
So, but does that look like on, on surface in the plan? Well, the idea is is to what we want to do is implement uh, a 2,500 to 3,000 meter drill program. Originally, we were just aiming for another five or 600 meter program like we did last year, but we need to go deeper uh, to hit those main IP and magnetic lows. Uh, so, the idea is to do like a 3,000 meter drill program, and those will be focusing firstly on you know the center vein where we have the best control of of that system based on, you know, gold on surface, gold and drill hole, and uh, good IP and a magnetic low. So a lot of it will focus uh, in here. Uh, in fact, some of these lines, you know, it doesn't look like there's a lot of drilling. Some of these are gonna be drilling three uh, fenced holes um, from the same from the same setup. So the real focus is what we call the center vein in here, the hottest pond vein, which is a very strong magnetic low and the most robust IP anomaly we have on the project. And then still hitting what we call the whole five hole vein and, and, and the boulder vein. And there's no doubt there is mineralization uh, in, in this area. We're quite certain now uh, that, that the boulder comes from somewhere in here. We did some trenching in here and see rocks that look uh, very, very similar to that, that 111 gram boulder. Then eventually we'll start tracing them up north. We'll ideally like to get one or two holes into what we call the conquest north target, just because it's, it's buried. So we don't have a lot of information on it. Uh, so by the end of the program, we'd uh, I'd like to, I mean, I'd really like to hit the main target, but at least get more information as to uh, what may be underlying uh, this area up in, up in here. But, you know, we feel very confident with the data we have. We're, we're on the right track. Multiple data sets are pointing in the right direction. And so initially, much of the drilling is going to happen in, in and around this center vein, first hitting it fairly shallow, but then continually going down to about uh, 400 meters depth or 300 meters depth, 400 meter holes. Uh, to hit these things where they have coincident magnetic and, and IP targets. So the investment opportunity, well, we you know talked about this being elephant country and elephant country doesn't necessarily mean there's a bunch of big, big deposits. Some elephant countries that just have one, but we believe uh, we've now got that elephant by the tail, so to speak. And so the investment opportunity is 100% in root and cellar, which we believe is now we've got, we've got the elephant by the tail. Um, you know, low sulfidation epithermal gold systems are renowned for the bonanza grades of gold, silver, and, and other metals, and typically related to, to, to relatively small tonnages that still add up to ounces because of their grades. But, and so, you know, we have, as you mentioned, grab samples up to 111 grams per ton of gold, nearly 1400 ppm silver, uh, tellurium in the 700, sorry, 1400 ppm uh, silver, yeah, 700 ppm tellurium and, and copper. So without a doubt, the high grades are there. But a select few of these low sulfidation gold deposits are also associated with very large tonnages. And, uh, you know, as I think you've seen from a summary of this presentation, we have a very comprehensive exploration model. And multiple data suggests that data, data sets suggest that root and cellar uh, has all the ingredients to form one of those very few giant and high grade uh, epithermal occurrences. And those opportunities don't always come around very often. Uh, Sometimes they're found uh, a little bit by, by luck or unexpectedly. Um, but at, at Root and Cellar, we're having, we see all the ingredients uh, that there could be a very large and fertile uh, epithermal gold, silver, and tellurium system here at, at Root and Cellar. And so we're keen to uh, commence the next round of drilling, hopefully uh, next month. And uh, But all the data is pointing uh, very, very strongly. And that's what gives you gives us great confidence going into the drill program is we have a lot of data sets that are pointing in uh, in, in the right direction from the, say from the large scale uh, down to the small scale features. So that really summarizes my presentation. I say it was just a quick run through. Uh, we have a lot more detail on the fuller presentation on the website, which will also be updated in the coming days with some, with some more detail. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you, Ian. And for any individual that came in a little late, we are doing a Q&A session right now. There are a few questions already. Now, Ian, you summarized this rather nicely on the second last slide, slide 16, uh, regarding the conquest zone. But if you want to, uh, maybe I'll intertwine Rock's question as well. But if you could walk us through your prioritized drilling and exploration targets for the next six to 12 months, and what specific indicators have led you to focus on these areas? I'll just add on, is it fully funded uh, right now? Uh, so right now, no, it's not uh, fully funded. Uh, we'll get back to that. We're, you know, we have a lot of interested parties, um, which, which we'll get into, uh, but it's not fully funded. And the idea is we want that 2,500 or 3,000 meter, meter drill program, but we're, I think we're going to be getting there. 
As far as prioritizing the targets, that's what that uh, last map showed. I mean, clearly you, we want to start in and around that Southern Conquest Zone, the center mound. Uh, we have, you know, the, the best grades there, uh, both in drill core and surface samples. Everything is pointing us in that direction. Um, and we were successful in 2023 with a very small drill program going in there and hitting mineralization. Um, and now it's just a matter of going in there and just keep hitting it deeper and deeper and deeper and following it down. Obviously, we're, we've are got the geophysics there to help, help control, but it's a matter of just following that deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think we're going to get into the main system. Uh, the other priority, obviously, is what we call the Hotter's Pond uh, rain system. Uh, I mean, it has some of the best geophysics. We just don't have the best geochemistry on the surface part. There's a lot of bogs in that area, so we're not, we're not seeing the rocks. But we think we have later volcanic rocks dumped on top of that. Uh, so that gold signature, Pathfinder signature, not coming through in every place. We do have the Rhyolite Dome right next to us, which it always carries gold mineralization, low grade, 100 to 800 ppb. Uh, but that suggests that there's probably something leaking uh, from below. So that's, that's a priority target too. It's a little bit deeper than the center zone, um, but it looks a lot bigger. And so that's really the, the the immediate focus for the drill program is on those two zones. And of course, uh, a little bit east where we're, we're maybe hitting br smaller branches or you know some of the lateral flow um, of the vein system. But the, the focus is what we call the center vein system um, and, and the hotter's pond. And then I think once we what we're starting to check in those is you know the filling in the gaps is going to become um i think a little bit uh, more routine but that's definitely the focus right now on uh, on the drill program and further surface exploration will then be trying to uh, i say we've got that student on the mapping understanding the geology a little bit better to the what we call the conquest north so we can again when we get to drilling and carry out more exploration and there uh you know have a little bit more confidence by by understanding the rocks a little bit more and then branching out uh, again back to drop zone braxton bradley we've done very little work but uh, i mean the rocks there that we've seen from from the past drilling and being on being on surface look extremely interesting and so at some point we need to get over to braxton bradley and start upgrading that to the sort of same level as uh, as a conquest um, but to say the immediate focus is uh, that center zone and uh, and the hotter's pond fault Right. Uh, we'll go back to the drill in here because Rock has a follow-up question. Uh, what depths are you planning to reach? I believe you mentioned 400 meters during the presentation. Yeah, the 400 meter holes is 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 the is a planned length of the drill hole. Uh, that's not the vertical depth because we got to step back. Uh, so so the in that area, which really the deepest drilling right now is uh, is a hottest pond fault area. So we're trying to hit targets as deep as 250 meters. Uh, and there's multiples of those, so we're sort of stepping back. So it's it's a 250 meter vertical depth, uh, but the hole is going to be around 400, 450 because we need to step back to hit that at, at a certain angle. Plus, some of those holes we're trying to hit multiple targets. We're trying to get the IP. In some places, the magnetic lows are offset from the IP; so they're sort of parallel to it, uh, but right next to it. And so, you know, we we think the mineralization is more related to the chargeability, but sometimes that could be more the alteration and then you know your big vein system your specification could be the magnetic low so we want to hit both scenarios in the same drill hole so that's why some of these are are fairly long and with the ones in the in the center zone same thing uh, not as deep maybe hit them as deep as 200 meters uh, but several holes will be about 400 meter in length just because we're trying to hit several targets uh, mm -hmm. on, on the way down right now, now, does it make sense to bring on a potential partner or joint venture to help accelerate development? Well, I mean, it would be nice to accelerate development with, with an actual JV partner. Um, but right now, we just because we think we may be onto something very sizable, we'll prefer to keep you know that opportunity for a later date uh, when there'll be better reward for, for the shareholders. Uh, but we are looking and and have been entertaining some strategic partnerships more on, on the equity side. And I uh, say there's several parties that that are interested that know these systems very well. And, and that's why there's been a slight, slight delay in moving forward on a financing uh, for the markets as to where we'd really like one of these one of these uh, institutions who, who know these systems very well as a as a strategic investment uh, partner. And once we have that, that will, you know, moving forward, number one, it's, it's an immediate stamp of approval. Uh, but then I think the speed of, of development and further exploration would, would come with that. So 
Yeah, I mean, the, the trade-off of, of a JV right now is, is giving up a big chunk of the property um, mm -hmm. for relatively low gain for the shareholders, other than the speed, which is, which is important. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, there's there's some parties that are that are showing some interest, uh, and would, you know, I'm just trying to uh, wait as long as I can to see if that will come to uh, come to fruition. So, so what key technical milestones or de-risking events do you anticipate could drive value creation in the near term? Well, obviously, the, the drill program, getting in there and just continuing to hit minimization and actually tap, track into to depth and start seeing some continuity between holes to holes. Um, and so that would be the, you know, the main de-risking factor. I, I think prior to that drill program, uh, we've almost done as, as, as much as we can. I mean, I say even the work that the students done, and I've just showed one geochemical method uh, that he's used. He's used multiple methods that all show the same thing. Um, and so we have we've felt we've de-risked it almost as much as we can from, from surface work. And now it's a matter of, of, of drilling it. Um, but again, being a little bit more methodical, I'm trying to track this thing down. At Otter's Pond, we kind of just, you know, have to go for the Mm -hmm. uh, go for the juggler, so to speak, because it's we don't have a lot of other data other than the, the magnetics and the geophysics. <clears throat> Whereas, at least in the in the center zone, we have a lot of supporting data, and so uh, you know you can't just to step back and try to hit it deep into the bullying zone right away. Um, but we'd much rather just try to track it down slowly and understand it. And that was a little bit of our mistake in in 2021 when we did the very first drilling. We had these IP targets. We drilled on their surface, and we have seen they continue to depth. And we so we just step back and and pump holes deeper into these IP anomalies, but the IP anomalies didn't continue to depth. Um, and, and so, but you know, now we we have a lot of control in that center zone. So we'll slowly in that drill program, we'll hit them shallow and slowly start stepping back and and hitting these targets deeper. But I say I think the work to date has done a lot. At, you know, de-risking it as, as, as much as you can, um, you, you know, especially on a relatively shoestring uh, budget this past year, uh, we've, we've had our heads down to really try to squeeze as much, much information we can out of the rocks, out of the geophysics um, and the geochemistry. Um, so I think we've done, uh, essentially, we can always do more, but, and things always sort of pop up along the way, but, uh, you know, all the data sets keep pointing in, in the same direction and that that gives a lot of confidence yeah the data compilation is extremely important and, and you kind of addressed greg's question here but i just want him to know that i am reading the chat so i'm going to answer uh, ask it again here but you, you just kind of addressed it but what is the risk given the hopeful characterization sorry say that again please he says also what is the risk given the hopeful characterization What's the risk? Well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure I understand, but I guess the risk is it's, it's not there, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's maybe it's not an elephant. Maybe it's small. Uh, of course, with exploration, there is a risk, but you just you have to go with the data you have. We have a, a large footprint of of low grade gold, uh, which we're not in the heart of the epithermal system at all. So you assume that's that's leakage based on you know, the grade and the textures that we're seeing and the geochemistry. And then we clearly have indications that we're seeing classic epithermal alteration assemblages, chemistry, textures. And so, you know, I'm you getting know. a further commentary here uh, regarding the drilling in November, risk of, of, of not drilling in November. Well, they were, uh, uh, whether there, the winter is, is not going to be a problem. The only problem is obviously is, is Christmas going to get in the way. Uh, but the idea, uh, what we're working towards right now, is trying to get a, a drill program underway uh, that can, we can complete before before Christmas. Um, so a three thousand meter drill program is going to be somewhere on the order of thirty to forty five days. Perhaps we can uh, downsize it or split it on either side of Christmas. Um, <laughs> but but the aim right now is to still try to get a drill program in before Christmas. If not, then 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 early in the new year. Is it year-round access to the site? Rock is inquiring. Yeah, it's it's really year-round access. Uh, that part of Newfoundland does not get a lot of snow, and even if they do, it 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 melts quickly. It's not that deep. I mean, last year the, these guys were hardly snowmobiling. There just wasn't enough snow on the ground, other than for a few days here and there. 
you got to be careful of you know mud and stuff like that but uh, you can really drill there um, uh, year round now you have quite a few long stand and shareholders but rock's wondering about the jurisdiction of newfoundland in regards to mining and exploration for any one new to the story. How is it operating out of Newfoundland? Uh, I, I I love Newfoundland for for exploration. Uh, I mean, from day one, I, both as an individual uh, and a corporation, I've never felt more more welcome. Um, and one of the reasons I, I like it is because it's it's vastly under underexplored. Uh, Nolan Shields' forte is is looking at essentially untouched ground. That's typically meant being you know more remote areas which require logistics helicopters and in the past when we worked up in northern quebec northern ontario you do a huge amount of your budget on on helicopters before even getting on the ground but in newfoundland you have that unexplored terrain uh, but it's but it's accessible by by roads i say we're we're about a 10 minute drive from from marystown uh to the end of the road and then then it's a 10 15 minute walk and you're right you're right at the center mound. Um, and, and so access is, is exceptional. Uh, people are very welcoming when I've been there uh, on, on the ground myself. I mean, it's, you're made to feel welcome right away. And they're almost like, what can we do to, to help you succeed here? Um, so uh, as a jurisdiction, I, 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 I very much a, a proponent of, of exploring in Newfoundland. Excellent. My uncle's Newfie. We have Jake's dinner every once in a while on the weekend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that's it for the questions in the Q&A chat, though, Ian. So if you have any closing remarks, but anyone that came in a little later, this event is being recorded. So the replay will be available on YouTube within a couple of hours. Oh, one more question just jumped in the chat here. What infrastructure is available that you won't have to build? Uh, power is one of the and well i mean yeah i mean that's that's the question for 10 years down the road but i mean obviously there's power there there's there's a town that it's been powered there's there's uh, uh you know a few industrial facilities like um you know, ship repair yard uh on the coast so you know the, the the basic infrastructure is there the roads are there power is there of course you know mine may, may, may need more um and you're 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 right on the coast, so there's 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 easy access to um, you know deep water ports, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And you have you know the, the Boise Bay smelter is right across the bay, um, so there's there's no shortage of uh, you know, I want to say basic infrastructure, but the basis of infrastructure is 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 right there. Excellent. Any closing remarks before we head out here, Ian? No, well, that's to say we we like where this is heading. Uh, you know we're the markets have been a little bit tough. Uh, even with gold prices moving, it's only just beginning to see some effects of filtering down to the juniors. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a lot of a lot of science has gone into uh, this project, and it's painting a, to me a very compelling picture of of, uh, um, of a large and and, and high grade epithelial gold occurrence. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you everyone that attended and asked questions. Again, the replay will be made available shortly here. But thank you very much, Ian. Thank you.